Wonderful. Thanks, Sandra. So yeah, I'll talk about uh, homomorphic encryption in this hour and the next. Uh, this hour would be mostly about uh, somewhat homomorphic encryption. Uh, many of the slides, both this hour and the next, are taking from Craig there. Um, so let's get started. Um, homomorphic encryption essentially is just a way to delegate processing of data without giving away straight access to that uh, data. <clears throat> uh, so here is probably the, the best uh, type of application of this technology. There's Alice there. Uh, she wants the cloud to store her storage for her and do the processing on that data for her, but uh, she doesn't want the cloud to see what's in there. So she's going to encrypt the data to, to the cloud. Um, she has her X that she cares about. Uh, later on, she's going to send a function that she wants the cloud to compute on X on her behalf. Uh, the function can be encrypted as well, or maybe in the clear. Uh, the main thing is the cloud should be able to run some evaluation procedure on the encrypted data and the description of the function. Uh, and this is really the special sauce. This is the, same, the thing that's special about homomorphic encryption. It allows the cloud to do this kind of processing. Um, and the time that it takes to do this processing is essentially the same as the time that it would have taken uh, to do the same processing on the data in the clear up to some polynomial factors in the security parameter. Uh, the cloud will return the encryption of the result uh, to Alice, and then Alice can use her secret key to decrypt. So that's the sort of the typical, or, or at least the um, most straightforward application of, of computing on encrypted data. Um, and one important uh, feature of this uh, scenario is the fact that Alice wants the cloud to do that uh, is because she wants to save work. She doesn't want to do all of her work. So in particular, the work that Alice does, encrypting X and decrypting F of X, should be a lot smaller than the cost of computing F of X from scratch. Ideally, we would like this cost to be completely independent of the complexity of F. So the amount of work that the server is doing uh, relates to the complexity of F. The amount of uh, work that the client is doing in this application should not. <clears throat> um, in terms of what it is, uh, homomorphic encryption is first and foremost, it's an encryption scheme. So there is key generation, there is encryption, there is decryption. Uh, the added source here is another procedure. This is a functionality requirement of the encryption scheme. Uh, an evaluation procedure uh, that you can apply to encrypted data. Uh, in terms of security, we're not talking about anything special. This is just the standard notion of semantic security or passive security or chosen plain text uh, security, whatever you want to call it. But this is the basic uh, security requirement. Um, the thing that makes it special is the correctness requirement from the evaluation. So what we want is if you have a bunch of messages uh, and you're encrypting these messages, uh, then you apply the evaluation procedure on the resulting ciphertext with some particular description of a function f and decrypt the result. Uh, what you get is the thing that you expect to get, the, the application of f to the underlying messages. Uh, and the small amount of work requirement for Alice uh, comes into play in the compactness requirement. We want the complexity of decrypting the result, C star, to be independent of the complexity of computing F. So these are the, uh, these are the uh, procedures and what we want from them. Um, and uh, before I start talking about this thing, let's just go through the analogy here. Uh, I'm sure many of you, probably all of you have seen that. Um, so here's Alice, she wants, she has her raw material, this is her actual data, she wants to assemble it to this um, very valuable piece of furniture, uh, furniture, well, maybe that too, <laughs> uh, <laughs> jewelry. <laughs> Uh, but she doesn't trust the worker, she doesn't want the worker to have access to the raw material. Um, <clears throat> so what she would do is she would encrypt this, she would put it in a locked box, uh, but it would be a special locked box that allows somebody to process things even while they're in that locked box. Uh, and it's a glove box, so the worker can come and with the gloves assemble this uh, piece of jewelry, and then Alice can use her key to get the result out. Um, and 
at least for the purpose of uh, this presentation, and actually, uh, in general, it's useful to think of homomorphic encryption as coming in two flavors. There's the somewhat homomorphic encryption. It lets you compute on encrypted data, but maybe not everything. You can compute some functions. There is a class of functions that you can compute uh, on encrypted data. Uh, and other thing that we had before uh, Craig's 2009 work was of this variety. So you can compute additive, uh, you can compute linear functions, or you can compute branching programs, or things like that. Uh, Post-2009, the thing that we also have is a fully homomorphic encryption, which means uh, I have one system, uh, one encryption scheme, and I can compute any function on the encrypted data that I want. Um, one thing that's probably not really needed in this audience, but uh, first, because it's recorded, and second, actually, whenever you uh, describe homomorphic encryption to people who are not cryptographers by training, it's very useful to go through this paradox and explain why it's not really a paradox. So here is a particular application. Uh, the cloud has my uh, encrypted files and my public key, so there is an encryption of F1, F2. Uh, and later, I want to do a private information retrieval. I want to fetch one of these files uh, without the cloud knowing which of them I fetched. So I'm going to encrypt the index of the file that I'm interested in uh, and send it to the cloud. And the cloud would evaluate the lookup function, the function that takes as input all the files and the index and return uh, the, cor the correct one. <clears throat> So when it's you know, said like this, it seems a little paradoxical because, well, the server eventually is going to send me an encryption of my third file, and it has an encryption of my third file. Can't it just see that it sends me the third one? Uh, and of course, the reason it's not a paradox is because we're talking about uh, semantic secure encryption. So uh, it's randomized, and there are many encryption of the same thing, and identifying the two things encrypt the same thing, uh, this is the thing that security says that you cannot do. So um, with that, let me, uh, before starting talking about how to do homomorphic encryption, let me talk a little bit about properties of homomorphic encryption, some limitations of it. Um, um, so let me start from some properties, properties that homomorphic encryption may or may not have. One property that it definitely does not have is chosen ciphertext security. This is malleable by design. You cannot possibly get the standard notion of, home, of uh, chosen ciphertext security if your underlying uh, home, uh, encryption scheme is homomorphic. You can get weaker notions. So for example, CCA1 or the lunchtime attack type, uh, uh, maybe you can get that. There are other meaningful notions of uh, non-malleability that apply to homomorphic encryption. Uh, in particular, homomorphic signatures is probably the most interesting of them, and maybe Daniel will talk about it uh, later on. Uh, Multi-hop, that's another, um, um, f from everything that I said before, uh, I said that once you encrypt your data, you can compute on it using the eval procedure. There's a question of whether once you computed it and you get the C star, can you keep computing on it after the fact? Uh, most schemes that we have, yes, the answer is yes, you can. Not always. Uh, and there are some things that you can do if your crypto system doesn't support it. You can uh, fix it so it does support it, at least to some extent. Uh, function privacy. Uh, whether or now let's say that it's not Alice who chooses the function to compute. It's the server that decides what is it that it wants to compute. Alice just gets the result. Can Alice tell what the function was? Well, on some sense, because the size of the ciphertext doesn't grow with the complexity of F, it's clear that there, it's clear that there is some loss of information there. But maybe Alice can still de uh, decide whether it was F1 or F2 that was computed. Um, the Constructions that we have don't necessarily come with uh, function privacy, uh, especially not in the case where you care about malicious security, where Alice's public key was malformed, or maybe the ciphertext was malformed. So sometimes you need to pay attention to that. In the honest but curious, where everything was generated according to the prescribed algorithms, usually it's easy to get function privacy out of the constructions that we have, uh, and also in general, actually. 
something that Vinod mentioned before, I'm going to mention it in a, just a few more details. Uh, for homomorphic encryption, the distinction between secret key encryption and public key encryption is not important. There is an easy generic black box transformation uh, constructing one from the other. This is a th uh, theorem by uh, Ron Rothblum from uh, four years ago. And it goes like this. The construction and its proof are, are fairly simple, so I'm just going to do them on the slides. Um, well, you have a secret key encryption scheme, and you want to make a public key encryption scheme out of it. So you need to publish something as your public key. What would it be? What it would be is just a collection of many random bits and the encryption of those bits. So many pairs BICI, where CI is an encryption of BI. Um, and how many of them? Well, that depends on how large your ciphertext gets. If the ciphertext is uh, of some length, you need to choose more bit than it takes to represent a single ciphertext. Uh, now that you have that, if you want to encrypt a bit sigma, what you do is you choose another random bit string R, such that the inner product between your bit string and the bit string in the public key gives you the bit that you want to encrypt. Uh, and then you just compute homomorphic inner product. You just take the summation of all the CIs corresponding to RI equals 1. This is just the mod 2 inner product of uh, R and B. And because this is additively homomorphic, then the result uh, is a ciphertext that actually encrypts the bit that you wanted. So uh, here it is again. The public key is the set of, uh, is the set of uh, pairs B and C. Uh, to encrypt, you choose a random R and you compute homomorphic inner product. Correctness is immediate from the fact that this is homomorphic encryption, and security is actually fairly easy to see. Uh, the only observation you need, really, is that the transformation from the bit string R to the end result ciphertext C uh, loses information. Where you started from L bits, you ended up with a ciphertext that takes less than L bits to represent. You lost some information there. Uh, and now you can think of this C as some leakage that tells you something about your, uh, about your uh, original R. And if you, for a second, imagine that all the encryptions are encryptions of zero as opposed to encryptions of B, then this is essentially the only thing that, the only piece of information that you get uh, about your uh, random, uh, randomness R. And since the inner product is very good in leakage resilient, then it means that you cannot uh, predict, just seeing C, you cannot predict uh, the inner product between um, B and R. And since this is a secure encryption scheme, then you cannot tell the difference between having their uh, encryptions of bits and having encryptions of zero. So that's pretty much the entire transformation and its proof. Uh, and it's very convenient when talking. So uh, the leakage could be could depend on uh, what B is, right? Right. So you, right. But once you switch to this all zero, then there's nothing, you know, nothing related to B there. Um, so, and it's very convenient when working with a morphic encryption scheme because, as we know, did you can always describe your crypto system in terms of a secret key encryption scheme, and then just wave your hands and say, yeah, yeah, there is a public key there. Um, some things that uh, homomorphic encryption doesn't do. So it doesn't do obfuscation. What obfuscation is, we'll hear about it uh, later in this uh, boot camp. But essentially, I can give the cloud an encryption, encrypted program, and then the cloud can evaluate that encrypted program on inputs of its choice and get the answer. Uh, and it learns nothing about my program in some sense other than the output. Uh, the main difference, well, you can encrypt your program and have the, the cloud uh, run it on, on instances of its choice also when you use homomorphic encryption. But in the case of homomorphic encryption, once you're done computing, the thing that you have in your hand is a ciphertext, and you don't know what it is unless you have the secret key. Uh, obfuscation, you actually get the result in the clear, and that's a very big difference. Uh, indeed, we know that obfuscation, you cannot do obfuscation uh, if it's strong enough for Certain types of obfuscation are impossible in general. Uh, other types of obfuscation are possible under some assumptions. And again, we will see more of that later in this workshop. <clears throat> uh, another thing that homomorphic encryption doesn't do is random access. Uh, so yeah, in terms of being able to compute something, uh, circuits can compute anything that any other normal 
uh, reasonable model for uh, computation does, but the complexity is not always the same. Uh, it's more or less the same as the complexity of Turing machines. It's not always the same as the complexity of random access machines. First of all, there is a quadratic or cubic uh, blow up in every computation, but in some settings where there's pre encrypted data ahead of time, like a sorted array, for example. With random access, you can access something in logarithmic many uh, steps, whereas with circuits, it has, it has to be linear. Uh, and homomorphic encryption doesn't do, uh, uh, that can't do random access. Um, and in general, you can't do random access on encrypted data because it's encrypted and you don't know what it, where, what's, what's in it. Uh, what we can do, there is an oblivious RAM. There are solutions that do work in RAM complexity or close to that, but they're very interactive typically. Uh, you can use obfuscation to do oblivious RAM and that get, get rid of some of the uh, uh, interaction for you. Um, and I don't think we will hear about it in this workshop, but I'm not sure. Maybe we will. Uh, homomorphic encryption doesn't do multi-key. So, so far I was talking about Alice as the one doing the encryption and everything done under Alice's key, but there are multiple people in the world and all of them have their own keys and maybe you want to compute on data that came from different people and is encrypted under different keys. Homomorphic encryption out of the box doesn't necessarily do that for you. Uh, there are constructions that, are, that can do this and hopefully I will have time to talk about one of them. Uh, so with that, I'm sort of done talking about what homomorphic encryption is and what the properties is, or it does or doesn't have. So let's talk a little bit about how to construct them. Uh, and essentially, there's you know two easy steps. The first, express your uh, function as a, as a as a circuit with uh, addition and multiplication gate, and then design a crypto system that encrypts bit and, and can support addition and multiplication. That's easy enough. Uh, the second thing is, 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 of course, where the hard part is. The first one is generic. Uh, so let's start from a toy example. Um, this is uh, from the American Scientist magazine. Uh, so imagine for a second that multiplication by two was a secure encryption scheme uh, for some reason. <laughs> Uh, well, then you have a homomorphic encryption. Just multiply everything by two. Do you want to add them? Well, add the ciphertext. That would give you, uh, right, uh, three and five was, is your data. Six and ten is the encryption. Uh, Sixteen is indeed uh, an encryption of eight. That works nicely. Uh, if you want to multiply, well, it almost works, right? I mean, six and ten, when you multiply them, you don't really get the 30 that you expect, which is uh, multi uh, encryption. You have to divide by two. So yeah, you multiply by each other and divide by two, and that gives you an encryption of, of your. So uh, yeah, that's a sort of maybe a silly example. But the thing that it does actually uh, bring across is this notion of homomorphism. And I want to spend two slides talking about it. At least in our head, when we think about yeah. more encryption scheme that supports addition and multiplication, most of us have this notion of homomorphism. This is why uh, it was called by uh, uh, Rives, Adelman, and the uh, homomorphic um, privacy homomorphism. There is the space of plain text, which is a ring, in this case, a ring of integers mod 2. Uh, and then there's the space of ciphertext, which we would think of as also a ring. And we would like to have this um, commutative diagram that mathematicians have when they're talking about homomorphism. Uh, there is this encryption that relates the two rings. And then there is the addition and multiplication operations within the ring. And you can apply the operation in the ring of plain text and then encrypt. Or you can apply the operation, or you first encrypt and then apply the operation. And you want to get the same thing. This is the thing that we have in mind when we think of uh, homomorphic encryption. Um, and it comes with a warning. The warning is that, yeah, it's a nice intuition. You shouldn't take it too literally. Uh, because if it was really homomorphism in this form, then encryption of zero would have been a subspace, a linear subspace, or an ideal, uh, more generally. Uh, and then, you know, whether you can identify encryption of a zero is a question of whether you can have an algebraic structure and an ideal inside of that algebraic structure uh, where you can actually hide the ideal. Uh, and there were attempts 
going that way, polycracker is probably the most uh, noticeable of them, uh, but they were all eventually broken. We don't know how to hide an ideal in, in, a, in a ring that actually supports all these operations that we want to do. Uh, so what do we do instead? Uh, this template by itself is not broken, right? I mean, you can, right. If, if you think of uh, Goldwasser Mikali encryption, that's exactly what happens there. Well, it's only additive, but you do have a linear subspace. It's just that you cannot do uh, Gaussian elimination in this representation. Yep. Um, so what we can do is to decide that we like linear algebra and we're going to build our thing on linear algebra, but we're going to add a little bit of noise into it so that you cannot solve it. That's essentially what's going on in all of these constructions. Uh, each cipher text has some noise in it that hides the message, message and you can think about it in, in the terms of error correcting code. It's the thing that you really mean is the code word, the thing that you show me is the code word with error. Um, well, Alice knows the, uh, some good representation of the error correcting code, and with that representation, she can correct. Uh, but that only holds if the error is small enough, because if the error is too large, then no matter what you know of the code, uh, if you have a point here in the, in the purple uh, area, you don't know which point it came from. So with that, let me describe perhaps the easiest crypto system to describe in one or two slides, uh, homomorphic encryption over the integers. The main idea, encryptions of zero are something small and even modulo a secret integer. So you have a secret key, which is a secret odd integer. Uh, the public key would be integers that are multiple of the secret key up to a small additive error. Uh, these are actually encryptions of zero, so it fits essentially the same uh, format of transforming secret key to public key encryption by publishing encryptions of zero. Uh, to encrypt, you take a subset sum and you add your message. To decrypt, you, compute, you take your ciphertext mod n, and that leaves you with only the error, which is either even or odd, depending on what the bit you encrypted. And if you want to add and multiply, well, just add and multiply over the integers. Um, if you make the right hardness assumption, it's even secure. I'm not going to say anything more about that. Um, well, you know, since the thing that happens, you have the multiple of the secret key and then the distance to the multiple of the secret key. The multiples just get added and multiplied and then fall off once you do decryption. The error is where you're actually doing the work. Uh, and when you, the error, as long as you don't wrap around this secret key of yours, uh, then the error, the multiplication and addition uh, is also happening over the integer. So in particular, the mod two version of it uh, happens mod two. Uh, well, the, the, it's not so, again, since it's homomorphic encryption, how do you do the encryption is not very important. The point is encryption of zero is something whose, the, where the distance to the nearest multiple of n is even. Encryption of one is where the distance to the nearest multiple is odd. And as long as you don't wrap around, it stays this way. Uh, so when you add things, you get the sum of the errors. When you multiply things, you get the product of the errors. And in general, when you apply any arbitrary polynomial, you get that polynomial applied to the error as long as there is no wraparound. Um, the noise grows, right? You apply some polynomial to integers, these integers grow. And as soon as they hit n over 2, uh, well, now your noise is too large and you lost your, in your data. Uh, and that's a problem. Uh, so yeah, you can, if you know that you want to do a computation of certain complexity, maybe you can make your secret key large enough. But that's a problem because, um, you know, it has to have enough room to grow. It goes uh, exponentially with the degree. So the number of bits in your noise grows lin linearly with the degree. If you want something that you can express uh, in polynomial size, you can only support things uh, of polynomial degree. Uh, and that's, so from now on uh, until somewhat close to the, probably in the middle of the second hour, I'm going to talk about things that you can do to better control the noise or get better assumptions and things like that. Um,
And since everything we do in lattice-based crypto, we sort of like it when it's based on LWE, then this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about homomorphic encryption based on LWE. The focus is going to be on the GSW scheme, even though the first schemes to do homomorphic encryption based on LWE was uh, Bokowski and Vaikutanathan. But this scheme is a little simpler to describe, so this is what I'm going to describe. So you're skipping this integer thing was just for motivation? Yeah, this integer thing was just to show the notion of noise and, and the noisy ciphertext and things. I'm not going to talk about it anymore because uh, well, it's the technical details there are actually harder and they're less. Actually, you can connect it back to LWE. This is, there's a recent work in Eurocrypt that show that, but it's a lot more complex and the, the road is a lot more, a uh, lot longer. This one is a little... Let's straightforward. Uh, so let me go back to something that Vinod described in the uh, previous hour uh, and talk about Regev's crypto system. And just let me warn you that uh, my matrices are the transpose of Vinod's matrices. <laughs> um, so Vinod's matrices were short and fat. Mine would be tall and skinny. Uh, and you multiply on the other side. Um, that's, I mean, the fact that uh, 10 years after Rodet's thing, the field hasn't converged on one or the other is uh, just, I guess, we're a testament to our individualism. I don't know. <laughs> um, right. <clears throat> so the secret key in, um, um, the secret key in uh, Regev's uh, encryption scheme uh, was the secret element S. And, but if you want to write it in a matrix form, it's actually easier to think about it as a vector that has one in the first coordinate and then the secret part of it later on. And the public key is a matrix uh, which is random, except that if you multiply it by the secret key, you get something small. Uh, so in Vinod's description, there was A and then a vector B. We package these together in one matrix that we call B, and the property of that matrix is when you multiply it by the secret key, you get something small. Uh, to encrypt a bit, uh, you choose a random uh, zero, one vector, so in particular, vector with small coordinates, uh, and you multiply it by the secret key, and then add Q over two uh, time your bit. So you either add Q over two, or you don't add Q over two to the first coordinate, uh, when you decrypt, you just take the inner product between the uh, secret key and the ciphertext, mod Q, and then what you get is, well, on one side you have R times B times T. Uh, B times T, we already said, is small. R is a small vector, so the inner product between R and B times T is also small. So all of this thing gives you some small error vector, and then you get Q over 2 times your a uh, bit, uh, so you recover it as just the most significant bit of the inner product. Uh, so that's um, Regev's encryption. Um, and so some properties, well, one property is that the ciphertext and secret key are vectors. Uh, the first enter in the secret key in one. It's actually extremely useful for manipulating things to have a secret key where one part of it is not really secret. It lets you do all kinds of things uh, later on. Uh, small dot products, if you have an encryption of uh, mu under t, then the inner product is mu times q over 2 plus something small, and this is exactly how you decrypt it. And in terms of security, it actually a little goes a little beyond uh, semantic security. So, uh, ciphertext are actually pseudo-random. If decision LWE is hard, uh, then ciphertext are indistinguishable from uniform vectors uh, to an attacker that doesn't know the secret key, and Vinod, was ac uh, Vinod actually proved that. Uh, you use the um, you use uh, decision LWE to argue that you cannot distinguish the public key from a random matrix, and then you use the leftover hash lemma to argue that uh, uh, if the matrix was completely random, then ciphertext would have been uniform ran uniformly random. Uh, and Regev's encryption scheme is actually additively homomorphic, homomorphic as it is. Uh, because, well, because you use inner product for decryption, and if you use inner product for decryption, then when you talk, uh, take the sum of two uh, ciphertext and you do inner product with the secret key, well, what you get is the sum of the two things. And again, as long as nothing wrap, wraps around Q, uh, 
uh, then um, it, it, uh, what you get is uh, an encryption of the sum of the two bits. Multiplicative homomorphism is a little more complicated because, well, our ciphertexts are vectors, and how do you multiply vectors? So here is one way you can multiply vectors. You can take tensor product of vectors. A uh, tensor product of two, vec uh, of two vectors is just the collection of all the pairwise uh, products of the entries. Uh, and actually does have some of the properties that you want because uh, there is the thing called the mixed product uh, theorem that says that if you take uh, the inner product between two tensor products is the same as taking the two inner products and multiplying them. Uh, so you can think of the ten this tensor product as encrypting the product of the two bits under another secret key, which happens to be the tensor of the other secret keys. There are issues here. For example, the, si the, the dimension gets squared with every multiplication. And in fact, these issues can be solved. This is uh, Bukowski and Vetkutanathan showed how to make this thing work. But in this talk, I'm going to take a, a different route and turn the ciphertext into matrices. And then, well, we know how to multiply matrices. So uh, that would be easier. <clears throat> so let's try to make uh, things into matrices. Key generation is going to be just the same as before. We have a secret key, uh, which is the same vector with one in the first coordinate and the rest secret. Uh, if you want to encrypt, well, what you do now is you take a matrix that correspond all the rows of that matrix are all encryptions of zero. So uh, in particular, it means that C0, this is sort of a matrix encryption of zero. When you multiply it by uh, the secret key, you get something small. Um, and then your ciphertext is going to be this encryption of zero plus the bit that you want to encrypt times the identity matrix. Uh, so before I'll, I'll show why it works, let's just take uh, a minute to say, talk about security. Uh, by the security of regular encryptions, uh, we said that ciphertexts are pseudorandom. So in particular, the C0 is pseudorandom uh, for attacker that doesn't know the secret key. Uh, and therefore, also the, the ciphertext C is pseudorandom. So security is covered. Uh, to decrypt, well, to decrypt, what you do is, again, you take a product between the uh, um, ciphertext and the secret key. And what you get is C0 times T that gives you a small error, and mu times I times T that gives you mu times T. So the end result is your bit times the secret key uh, plus something small. And then you decrypt to 0 if this is closer to the 0 vector, and you decrypt to 1 if this is closer to your secret key. Uh, so before that, we sort of uh, had q over 2 versus uh, 0. Now we have your secret key versus 0. So yeah, the secret key in this case would have to be slightly big so that uh, uh, you can actually make this determination. The dis distance between t and 0 should be larger than the error, I guess. Uh, but it's a first try. We're going to change it anyway. Um, but the nice thing about it, here the secret key, you can think about it as an approximate eigenvector of the ciphertext. Uh, so when you multiply the ciphertext by the secret key, what you get is roughly the scalar mu times your secret key up to some small error. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how to do uh, homomorphism. But let's start from an even simpler case uh, where there is no error. Let's, so let's imagine for a second that the secret key is an actual eigenvector uh, of your ciphertext. Uh, so you have a ciphertext matrix. You have a message, which is the eigenvalue. You have a secret key, which is the eigenvector. Uh, and in this case, well, ci times t is mu i is time t. This, is, this means ci encrypts mu i relative to the secret key t. Uh, well, now you have two matrices with the same eigenvector. So you can add and multiply them. And the eigenvalues add and multiply. That's easy to see. Uh, but we, but yeah, well, that wouldn't be secure without the error. So let's see what happens when you do have the error. So addition works. Addition, everything is linear, and, and the error just adds up, and we're good. Multiplication. Multiplication almost works. 
let's just open it and see what happens. Uh, right, so you multiply your matrices straight out, and now you try to decrypt the, the result. Then it, well, C1 times C2 times T, C2 times T is this approximate eigenvector. You have U2 times T up to an error. Uh, so the only added term here that you got is this is what we want, and this is the additional term that we have, C1 times E2. Uh, and you keep doing that, and eventually what you get is what you wanted. This is uh, the term uh, mu1 times mu2 times t is what you get in the error-free case, and then the error, um, the error uh, terms, which is the second message times the first error plus the second error times the first ciphertext. So it's somewhat asymmetric in nature. Um, and that's the new noise. And if we want to have some morphism going, we need to control it. We need to argue that this new noise, noise is small if the original noises were. Um, so there are two parts of the noise, and we need to deal with each one of them separately. One part is relatively easy, mu2 times e1. Well, mu is the plaintext. How do we make sure that the plaintext remains small? Well, we just say that it's always 0, 1, and we're going to work with NAND gates, so it would stay 0, 1. Uh, and therefore, this thing is, is, we shouldn't really worry about it. Uh, this one is a little harder. Uh, this one, well, C1 is a matrix, and it's actually a pseudo-random matrix. It's not small. Uh, so this thing, well, that's not small. So we need to do something else. Um, and can we flatten somehow the product? Can we make an equivalent product that has the same properties in terms of homomorphism, but well, we sort of represent this matrix by a matrix that does have a small coordinates? Uh, so that's so that there is a, a rabbit out of the hat. And actually, working in, in lattice-based crypto over the years. These rabbits tend to pop out every time there is a problem. Uh, and you know, usually, when they do, it's usually a G or a P or a V or some combination of them. That, uh, that <laughs> but by now, we have our herd of rabbits that we can use for various things. And this is the first one. This is something that Vinod should have covered in his talk, but it wasn't given the time. Uh, so I'm going to do, I'm going to talk, not very long, but I'm going to talk about this uh, for a little bit. How do you represent? It's a way of representing um, a matrix of low dimension with big entries by a matrix of larger dimension with small entries. That's essentially what it is. Um, this idea was used in the lattice trapdoor construction. It was implicit already in Aita's original one in 99, and it became explicit eventually with uh, Michancio and Packard. Um, what I want is a gadget matrix, and it's inverse transformation. So I have some matrix G, and I have an inverse transformation that's not linear. This is just a transformation that I can compute. Uh, and the properties that I need are the following. Uh, so it takes any matrix uh, which has small dimensions. Uh, it has uh, M rows and N columns, so it's long and skinny, and it makes it fat. It, makes, uh, it, it adds columns to it. So it takes a matrix C and represented by another matrix that has many more columns, but all the entries are small. And it has the feature that when you multiply it by G, you get back to your original C. Uh, here's an example of how to do that. Uh, probably the simplest example there is. Take all the entries in your matrix, and for each entry, just represent it in binary. Well, you, you multiply the number of columns by log Q. Uh, clearly, this matrix has small entries. Well, as small as they can get. They're either 0 or 1. Um, and what would G be? G would just be the way, well, how do you make an integer out of bits? You multiply them by the powers of 2. So this is your G, and this is your G inverse transformation. One way to think about this G, inver G and G inverse is that G is a special matrix that makes it very easy to solve SIS. Uh, and G inverse is just the transformation that you apply when you solve SIS for that G. 
Um, it's that representation, that uh, way of thinking about it is not particularly important for our application, but it might be important for other things. Uh, so, okay, now we have our gadget, and now let's see how we make an encryption scheme uh, out of it. An encryption would now be a matrix such that C times T is not mu times T plus error, but mu times T prime plus L, where T prime is G times T. Uh, the dimensions of things now changed. Um, before that, um, an encryption, uh, a ciphertext was a square matrix. Now a ciphertext is one of these skinny thing. Um, and uh, so this is M by N, this is N, and this is N2. Uh, so this is M, sorry. This is M, N by M, this is N, and this is M. Um, and it's easy to modify the encryption to get this form. Uh, one way to see that it's easy is because, well, this is going to be homomorphic, so we can always apply uh, Rothblum's uh, transformation. But it's going to be useful maybe for us to uh, see how to make it. Uh, instead of doing uh, C0 plus mu times the identity, we do C0 plus mu times this gadget matrix G. And that works. Uh, security follows from LW just as before. C0 was pseudorandom. C0 still is pseudorandom. So when you add this thing, it remains pseudorandom. Uh, additive homomorphism worked just like it did before because everything is additive. Uh, and for multiplication, let's go for it. Uh, so now instead of multiplying the matrices straight out, we take the left matrix and we apply this G inverse transform to it. So again, dimensions, M by N, M by N, once you extend it, M by M. So the matrices match, the dimensions match. Um, now when you multiply, uh, here you can open the uh, C2 times T. Uh, now T prime is G times T. Uh, now we see that we have G inverse of something times G, so they cancel out. You get your C1 back. Now you have C1 times T. Okay, now you can open this. And eventually you get something that looks very similar to what we had before with one crucial difference. This is sort of the error-free term that we want. This is what we want. And that's our error. We still have the same mu2 times e1, but that we don't care about. We're going to make sure that mu is always a 0 or 1. But now, instead of having the matrix C1 itself, we have its expanded representation. And that's good, because that one, no matter what C1 was, uh, G inverse of C1 has small entries. So that's our new noise, and, uh, and it is small. So let's, summary, let's, summar, uh, let's make a summary of what we have so far. Uh, we're pretty much done with the encryption scheme. Uh, we have an encryption of a bit mu. It's a matrix uh, such that when you multiply that matrix by, uh, by the secret key, what you get is mu times t prime plus a little bit of error, where t prime is this uh, g times t. Uh, additive homomorphism, you just add the matrices and the noise gets, gets added, which means you know, uh, it's at most twice the maximum between them. Uh, multiplicative homomorphism, well, you multiply them, except you expand the, uh, one of the matrices before doing that. And the, uh, the size of the error grows a little bit more. So E1, just we either get it or we don't. Uh, E2, we multiply it by a 0, ma 1 matrix. So the size grows maybe by M, where M is the dimension. Um, and that's already somewhat homomorphic because the noise goes slowly. So how many times we can do that? Well, we need the error to be small, smaller than Q, so that we don't grab, get wrapped around. Uh, every time we multiply, it gets mu uh, the error got, gets multiplied by at most m, m plus 1. So, oops, whoa. Um, so, well, at most log base m plus 1 of q levels we can, uh, we can uh, process. And I think I have like 15 more minutes, but I'm pretty much done with that part. <laughs>
right? I do have 15 more minutes, so we can sing along or something. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe we can just take the break earlier. I'm not sure. Let's take the break earlier because the second part might be a little longer than that. All right. So questions. Uh, 3.25 uh, maybe? Yeah, sure. So, 3.20. Okay, 3.20. I think the second part, the second part might be a little longer. So. Yeah, 3.20. Okay. 